Hello, Mr. Hardy here, and in this video I would like to teach you about Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth by William Shakespeare. So as per usual, you need to be familiar with this scene, you may have read it, listened to it, watched it, or studied it in class, and you're using this video to gain a deeper knowledge or to refresh your memory of it before an exam. In this video, I'll start by summarising the plot of the scene. We'll explore the key characters, themes, contexts, and I'll pick out some key quotes and techniques you may wish to commit to memory for your assessment. And I'll leave you with an exam style question you can attempt at the end if you want to practice and show your knowledge of this scene. So what happens in Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth? Um, well, Macduff has journeyed to England to see Malcolm, and if you remember, Malcolm is King Duncan's firstborn son, and therefore the heir to the Scottish throne, the rightful successor. Um, and Macduff has journeyed down to England to persuade him um, to fight Macbeth, because remember he fled after Macbeth brutally mur murdered his father, King Duncan. Um, he's asking him to come back and fight, reclaim his birthright, and that is to rule Scotland, as Macduff will, thinks that Scotland will be better off with Malcolm on the throne than Macbeth. Um, so Malcolm actually deceives Macduff, which sounds a bit strange, um, but he does this as a trust test. So Malcolm says to Macduff, what's stopping you from giving me up to Macbeth? If I come back to Scotland with you, what's stopping you from turning the sword on me, handing me over to Macbeth to be executed, and then Macbeth giving you some kind of reward or glory. And Macduff announces, you know, I am not a traitor, I wouldn't do this. Um, and Malcolm says, oh, well, it actually doesn't matter if you're a traitor or not, um, because even if you did help me get the throne of Scotland, my birthright, I would make a terrible leader. Um, Malcolm actually says he's so lustful um, that he would end up trying to sleep with all the women in Scotland, all the mothers and daughters and young women. And Macduff says, oh, that's that's not great, but I'm sure we could work around it. You'd still be a better king than Macbeth. Uh, so Malcolm takes it up a level. He deceives Macduff even more. He says, well, actually, not only that, I'm incredibly greedy. I'd probably go around just killing thanes um, just so I can take their land and their castles and their resources for myself. And Macduff is going, hang on a minute, this is this is really terrible. This actually sounds like a tyrant. Um, you kind of sound like Macbeth. And Macduff is so upset, he cries, oh, Scotland, Scotland. So he's, his heart is for Scotland to have a good ruler and to be peaceful and prosperous. Um, but it seems like it's impossible. Uh, Macbeth is ruling Scotland badly. And Malcolm, who's the rightful heir, admits he would rule Scotland badly. So at Macduff's point of great despair... Uh, Malcolm basically says, lol, jokes, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to be a really good king. And he says he's the, he's a virgin, he's never lied. Um, and, and he sort of says, I was just doing a trust test, a loyalty test. You've passed. And Malcolm announces that with the help of the King of England, um, that the King of England has offered Seward, who's a, a well-known uh, general and, and battle tactician, um, and 10,000 men to march up to Scotland and help Malcolm and Macduff overthrow Macbeth and restore Malcolm to, to the Scottish throne. Um, so Macduff's been on one heck of an emotional roller coaster. He went there all excited that Malcolm would help him overthrow Macbeth. Malcolm deceived him as a trust test. And Macduff was sort of down in the pits, really upset that Scotland would be unsavable and that he might never return to a, a good Scotland. And now he's back on top of the world. He's elated because not only does he have Malcolm, but he has uh, Seward and 10,000 men to help him overthrow Macbeth. However, the scene doesn't end there. A doctor enters and announces that the King of England is about to perform some healings. Um, this may seem completely irrelevant, but this is Shakespeare giving a little nod to a king called Edward the Confessor and the divine right of kings, which we know is a contextual piece of knowledge that informs Macbeth. I'll explain more about that later. Um, Ross then enters the scene 
And we know Ross is a thane of Scotland um, who's loyal to the throne. And he has some pretty bad news. So Macduff and Malcolm say, you know, how Scotland's they make small talk. And Ross is saying, oh, Scotland still suffers under Macbeth. It's not good. Um, and they can tell something's wrong with Ross. So Macduff says, how's my wife? How are my children? And Ross doesn't have the heart to give the bad news. So he goes, oh, you know, they're fine. No problem. Um, but eventually Macduff really pushes him and he goes, come on, that you've got bad news. Just get it over with. Tell me the bad news. And Ross announces that Macduff's wife and children have all been slain by Macbeth's murderers. And of course, Macduff is distraught um, and he, he believes it's his fault because he's left them um, undefended, unprotected, vulnerable. Um, and this is true. It is his fault because he's placed the welfare of Scotland over the welfare of his own family. Um, however, Malcolm encourages him to turn his grief into rage and in particular into revenge and to kill Macbeth and restore peace to Scotland. And that is Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth. So who are key characters in this scene? Um, well, of course, we have Malcolm. Um, and in my opinion, he shows signs of being a better king than his father, who, of course, was King Duncan. King Duncan was too easy to trust people, in my opinion. He trusted the Thane of Cawdor, who betrayed him, the old Thane of Cawdor. He trusted MacDonald, who betrayed him. Um, he promoted and trusted Macbeth, who betrayed him. Um, so whilst King Duncan was presented as a good king, um, you know, the angels heralded him. He was so good that his blood was like silver and gold. You know, he had, he had many good qualities, but I think he was too trusting. And Malcolm is smart. He's learned from his father's mistake and he actually does trust tests on people before he trusts them. So in my opinion, Malcolm is probably going to be a better king than his father. We, of course, have Macduff, and he is presented as incredibly loyal to Scotland. Um, he's so loyal to Scotland, I could argue that he's a traitor to his own family. Um, he values his country ahead of his own family. And as a result, his wife and innocent children have been slaughtered because he prioritised his country over his family. And I know in previous videos, we've had this debate as to which is better to be loyal to a country or to your family. Um, I think in the Jacobean era, 16th century England and Alban, Scotland, 11th century Scotland, I think it was probably better to be loyal to your country. Um, personally, I would choose family, but that's that's different times, different people. Um, and Macduff is clearly presented as a dangerous man. Um, I think there's a phrase, a man who has nothing to lose is, is the most dangerous man. Uh, Macduff has lost Scotland to Macbeth um, and he's also lost his wife and children to Macbeth. So he is incredibly dangerous to Macbeth. There's a real rivalry, a revenge, a tension forming between these two characters. Um, we have the Doctor uh, um, and he really hints at Edward to confess it. So in the 11th century, the King of England was called Edward, and it was believed he had healing hands. He could heal people. Um, he had put, a, I believe, a gold chain on them, and he would touch them with his hands, and they would be cured of all sorts of illnesses. And it was believed that this special power was granted to the king by God, and that the king would pass it on to his heirs, to his sons. And this sort of hints at the divine right of kings, that, that God chooses the kings, um, bestows them with qualities, maybe such as healing, and then that's passed on from father to son through generations. And that preserves this idea that God chooses the king, and we call that the divine right of kings. Ross, his job in the scene is mainly as a news bearer. He, he informs Macduff of the slaughter of his family, and that really pours sort of fuel on Macduff's fire and hatred towards Macbeth. So what themes um, do we have in this scene? Well, we have deceit. And the interesting thing is throughout Macbeth, and notice how I've got that in italics. So I'm referring to the text here, the tragedy. Um, when you handwrite, you should put Macbeth when referring to the text in a quote mark or a speech mark to make it clear you're not referring to the character. Um, throughout the play Macbeth, deceit has always been bad. Um, Macbeth Beth lied to King Duncan's face before murdering him. Um, when 
Macbeth saw Banquo's ghost lady Macbeth. Beth tried to deceive all the guests by saying that Macbeth has these fits often. Deception has been evil throughout the entire play. However, here it's used for good um, because Malcolm uses deception to do a trust test, a loyalty test. And only when Macduff passes um, does Malcolm work with him. So there's a nice, interesting reversal of deception being used positively here. We have loyalty, which is a key theme that we're seeing a lot of um, at this section of the play. Um, and Macduff's loyalty, uh, is it a strength or is it a weakness? Um, clearly, it's a strength if you believe in the Scottish throne and, and if you want to restore peace to Scotland, because that's what Macduff prioritises. But from his family's point of view, it's probably a weakness because he's so loyal to Scotland, he's left them vulnerable that they ended up getting slaughtered. Um, so we've debated this before. Um, I'll let you form your own opinion. Is Macduff's loyalty a strength or a weakness? Is he so loyal he's actually disloyal in other areas of his life? Uh, revenge. Um, I believe there's a phrase, revenge is a dish best served cold. Um, here, Macduff's revenge on Macbeth is, is really the, the driving force, the direction the play is moving in. Um, Macbeth has ruined Scotland. And we know that Macduff loves Scotland and Macbeth has ruined Macduff's family by literally having them slaughtered by a murderer. Um, so really, these two are um, at each other's throats. You could argue they're the protagonist and the antagonist. The protagonist is the main character. The antagonist is the main rival. But what's really clever with the tragedy of Macbeth is that Macbeth sort of starts off the protagonist, becomes his own antagonist through his action. And Macduff kind of replaces him as the protagonist. And at this stage of the play, I don't think the audience is rooting for Macbeth anymore, as they were at the beginning of the play. I think everyone's rooting for Macduff to slay Macbeth and restore peace to Scotland. So there's a really interesting battle between antagonist and protagonist at this stage of the play. We have the theme of evil reoccurring, and we see two really, really evil acts. Um, we see the slaughter of the innocent, so Macbeth has hired murderers to kill Macduff's wife and children who have done nothing wrong. Um, and, and they were used as, well, really, he, they stoked Macduff's fire. Um, there was a phrase earlier on in the play, we have scorched a snake, not killed it. Um, in this sense, Macduff is the snake. And if you scorch a snake, if you put a little flame to it, but don't kill it, the snake's going to get angry. Um, there's also that metaphor of pouring fuel on the fire. It just gets a bigger, hotter, more violent fire. Um, and the second evil we see is the evil of Macbeth's rule on Scotland. Uh, Malcolm explains how bad it is. Macduff then explains how bad it is in Scotland. Um, and then when Ross arrives, he also confirms how bad it is in Scotland. Um, so Scotland is really suffering under the evil of Macbeth's reign of terror. So contextually speaking, there's a few references Shakespeare is making here. Now, I'm no historical expert. I'm not a history teacher. So if I do get some things wrong, I hope I don't. Um, you may need to go to your history teacher to clear it up. Um, I think Shakespeare is making reference to Edward the Confessor. So we know that Macbeth is set in 11th century Scotland. Um, and Edward the Confessor was uh, the King of England from 1042 to 1066. And he was the king who the people believed could heal with his hands. So he put a gold chain on a sick person, um, he'd place his hands upon them, and he would sort of channel God's energy through his hands, maybe through the gold chain, into the sick person and heal them. And it was believed that this skill, this ability to heal, was passed on from father to son. Um, and it was maybe also a symbol of the divine right of kings, that God had chosen Edward and his heirs, um, and they were given some kind of supernatural ability, such as healing. Um, that obviously links quite closely with the divine right of kings, which, um, as we've studied before, is this idea that God chooses the king and then chooses the successors. So the heirs, the rightful heirs of the throne. Um, and when we mention the divine right of kings, it's always a good idea to link it to other concepts such as the great chain of being, how God has ordered the universe, and even the natural order. So if you break the divine right of kings, um, if you subvert that great chain of being, um, 
the, the natural order, the laws of nature are all broken and chaos happens and suffering happens, which is what Scotland experiences under Macbeth because he broke the great chain of being um, and therefore has also broken the divine right of kings and God is punishing um, Macbeth and Scotland as a result until the order is restored. And we have this idea of kingship. Kingship are the qualities that make a good king. Um, and obviously bad kingship would be the opposite, the antithesis, the qualities that make a king bad. And whilst Malcolm is trust testing Macduff, um, they explore what makes a good king and what makes a bad king. And they list a load of qualities um, that we'll look at in a little bit. We can see that Macbeth is all the qualities of a bad king um, and none of the qualities of a good king. And I think Shakespeare here is being clever because I think he's trying to curry favour. He's trying to praise um, his king at the time, which was, of course, King James I in 16th century England, Jacobean era. Um, and he was trying to sort of big up, as you were, King James I in order to curry favour for increased patronage for his plays and his theatre. Um, Shakespeare was very well versed on his history, but he never quite stuck to it. He used historical ideas to inform his writing. So we know from previous videos that Macbeth was a real historical figure. We know that Banquo was a real historical figure. Um, and here in the play Macbeth, England is going to invade Scotland. And we actually know at the time um, in, 11th century, in the 11th century, England, uh, England did invade Scotland through William the Conqueror. Um, so forgive my lack of history, but I believe William the Conqueror was French from Normandy and he crossed the channel and he invaded England. And then from there, he got an army and he went up north and he invaded Scotland. Um, now, if you're easily confused, this happened in 1072. If you're easily confused, cover your ears. Um, but if you want to follow along with a bit of historical knowledge to see how Shakespeare manipulates history, listen up. When William the Conqueror, um, using the English army and I assume some of the French army, went up to invade Scotland, the King of Scotland was called Malcolm. Sound familiar? The character Malcolm from Macbeth. Um, however, when Malcolm surrendered, uh, I think Malcolm handed over his son to William the Conqueror and Malcolm's son was called Duncan. So what, Macbeth, uh, what Shakespeare has done is he's read the history, but he sort of subverted it. So in the play Macbeth, Duncan is the father, Malcolm is the son. But using the real historical records, Malcolm was the father, Duncan is the son. That's my understanding of it. And that's just an example to show just how intelligent Shakespeare was. He used his historical knowledge, but he twisted it and manipulated it and changed it to be entertaining in his plays. If you had covered your ears, you can listen back in now. I'm going to focus back on the play Macbeth. I'm going to stop being a history teacher and start being an English teacher again. So here are the quotes. Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike. This is Macduff um, explaining to Malcolm what life is like in Scotland under Macbeth's rule. And we have some repetition here. Um, we have the repetition of the word new. And we have sort of different categories of people suffering. Widows are um, women who've lost their husbands. They suffer. Um, orphans are children who have no parents. They're suffering. Um, we have this alliteration of sorrow striking. It almost personifies sorrow that it's lashing out and hitting the Scottish people. And this happens every day, every new morning. Um, I'm not going to lie. Scotland under Macbeth's rule sounds pretty miserable. Um, Macduff, when also talking about Scotland, he says, bleed, bleed, poor country. Um, and this is also a personification. We know humans can bleed, um, but countries physically can't. Um, but giving a human quality to a non-human object, we call that personification. And actually, I believe Malcolm um, also extends this personification. He says that Scotland uh, weeps, it bleeds, and, and each day a new gash is added to her wounds. Um, so not only does he personify Scotland, uh, he also genders it as a her. Um, I spoke a little bit about kingship. Um, Malcolm gives us a list of all the qualities that a good king would have. Um, these qualities are justice, the ability to see right from wrong, verity, that means telling the truth, 
temperance, that means not having, a, uh, not being easily angered. Stableness, that means being able to regulate your emotions and be consistent. Uh, bounty, that means being generous, not being a coconut flavoured chocolate bar. <laughs> Perseverance, uh, not giving up, having resilience. Uh, mercy, being able to forgive others for mistakes. Uh, lowliness, being humble, so not being arrogant. Uh, devotion, I think that's twofold, devotion to God and devotion to your country. So you should be a, um, a religious person and sort of a, a nationalistic person. Um, patience, uh, so not getting easily upset, being able to be calm. Uh, courage, uh, remember it was a warrior culture, there was lots of tribes um, that would fight you for land, loads of Viking invaders, so you had to be courageous in battle. Um, fortitude means strength. Um, I don't necessarily think it means physical strength, but I think it means mental strength, the ability to, you know, make tough decisions. A lot of people are relying on you, the ability to not mentally crumble. Um, so Malcolm lists all these things that make a good king. Now, remember, Malcolm in this case is just a character. It's actually Shakespeare doing the writing. I think Shakespeare lists all these things so the audience can hear. And I think Shakespeare is suggesting that King James I has all these qualities. And remember, there was the gunpowder plot going on. There was assassination attempts on King James I's life. Um, I think by Shakespeare exemplifying, making an example of how good a king King James is, he has all these wonderful qualities, he's hoping... Uh, the English audience will stop giving King James such a hard time and will stop trying to assassinate him. And I'm sure King James was very grateful for this comparison to having all these good qualities. And as a result, he would have favoured Shakespeare more and funded more of his plays and performances. Um, that's how it works in my head, at least. So we have the opposite, the antithesis. Antithesis means opposite ideas. So if uh, the previous list was the quality of a good king, Malcolm now lists the quality of a bad king. Uh, a bad king is bloody, um, so causes a lot of death. Macbeth has caused a lot of death. So far he's killed King Duncan, um, Banquo, and uh, Macduff's wife and children. Uh, a bad king is avaricious, that means greedy. Um, a bad king is false, tells lies. We know that, that Macbeth tells lies. At the start of the play, he wrote a letter to his wife to explain everything. But as the play goes on, he starts withholding information, effectively lying to Lady Macbeth. Um, a bad king is deceitful. We know that Macbeth is able to deceive people. He deceived King Duncan, amongst many. Um, sudden here means the opposite of stable so whereas stable means you're consistent you can regulate your emotions sudden means you're quick to anger or you're quick to madness we know this is true of macbeth he saw banquo's ghost and he suddenly went mad um, and he can suddenly go angry and he can suddenly go sad he's quite an emotional roller coaster he's quite unreliable um, and malicious uh, the prefix mal means bad so malicious is someone who's bad who's evil and I think it's safe to say Macbeth is evil. Um, he's killed a good king, he's killed his best friend, and he's killed innocent uh, women and children. He is uh, not a good soul. Uh, Macduff, when he realises uh, that Scotland isn't going to be saved when Malcolm was pretending to deceive him, um, he cries out, oh, Scotland, Scotland. Um, one thing I tell my students is if you're quoting Macduff, just remember he loves to repeat stuff. Um, when he found uh, King Duncan dead, he said, oh, horror, horror, horror. Um, when he realises that Scotland is suffering, he says, bleed, bleed, poor country. When he realises again that Scotland's suffering, he says, oh, Scotland, Scotland. Um, so if you're going to quote Macduff, you might as well write the quote out twice, because <laughs> chances are he's repeated himself. Um, your castle is surprised, your wife and babe savagely slaughtered. Um, here, Ross is finally revealing uh, the news that he didn't want to tell because it's such horrible news. Um, savagely slaughtered, uh, particularly the adverb savagely is like a wild animal has ripped him to shreds. Slaughtered maybe as connotations of like an abattoir, of like animal, of meat being killed. Um, if you're really sort of stretching it, you could maybe argue there's some sibilance here. Um, sibilance is the repetition of the S sound. So you've got the castle is surprised, your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. 
that hissing sound is almost snake-like. It's quite evil in its deliverance. Um, and I think there's connotations of Macbeth being like a snake, um, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent underneath it, his wife told him, and strike and kill and poison people. And I think Macbeth's evilness is actually revealed through the sibilance in Ross when he reveals what Macbeth has done to Macduff's family. What, all my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop? Um, I quite like this metaphor Macduff uses to describe his family. Um, dam being his wife, uh, which I assume is a female chicken. I would have I thought female chickens are hen, but maybe it's also a dam. Um, and he refers to his children as sort of, sort of chickens and chicks. Um, and this metaphor would have been very accessible to the 16th century English audience who may have kept their own chickens and, and dams and chicks. And it really presents his family as innocent, which makes Macbeth look all the more evil. It's kind of like a foil, a contrast, a juxtaposition to Macbeth's evilness, that he would kill such innocent, defenceless animals, such as chicks and hens. OK, uh, please make some notes from this video on a physical copy of Act 4, Scene 3. Um, and if you want to really practice and show off your knowledge, you could answer this question. A student said Malcolm has better kingship qualities than Duncan, his father. How far do you agree with this statement? Um, a weak response would say that Malcolm is 100% better than Duncan and not explore Duncan. Similarly, an equally weak statement would say Duncan is 100% better than Malcolm and not explore Malcolm. Um, I think a good response to this will look at Malcolm's qualities, such as his lack of trust and how he does a trust test. And you might argue that Malcolm's good in that regard. Um, I think an advanced answer would also look at some of Duncan's positive attributions, how angels heralded him and how his blood ran like silver and gold. Um, and then whilst looking at their pros and cons, you know, Malcolm fled his country. That's quite cowardly. Maybe that's not a good kingship quality. Duncan was too trusting of Macbeth and, and got himself killed. That's obviously not a good quality. You'd weigh the pros and cons, balance your argument, and then eventually reach a conclusion. Is Malcolm, does he have the better qualities to rule Scotland than his father? Yes or no? You'll arrive to that at the conclusion of your essay. So your introduction might be both have good qualities and bad kingship qualities. Your body paragraphs might explore Malcolm's strengths and weaknesses then Duncan's strengths and weaknesses. And then eventually your conclusion might actually come to a decision. Who has the better kingship qualities, father or son? Well, if you found this video useful, please give it a like. Um, please also subscribe to my channel to get the rest of my Macbeth analytical videos. Um, and please leave a comment if you found anything interesting or insightful. Thank you for your attention. And I'll see you on the next one.